right, how are we doing today? We doing good? All right. So nice to have you. You guys are looking good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Matter of fact, turn around to somebody, tell them, say, you look good today. Come on, tell them you look better than you did last week. Go ahead, tell them. Ask them what they're doing. All right, welcome all those that are watching online, and uh, thank you for that. Today I'm excited. Kevin was just talking about how our young people had a great time at the Encounter Conference, and I'm telling you, I, I know Kevin already talked about it, but if you could have seen uh, the young people, young adults down there, I, I'm serious, when they would, the first note of the worship, the, uh, the altars were just packed with people worshiping, hands lifted, young people, unashamed, going after God, having encounters. It was just amazing. So thankful for that. Thank you uh, for helping. Um, and I heard you guys had a great time at the EXO conference here as well. I heard there was a little dance-off going on or something. Man, dancing in church, that's what I'm talking about. All right, hey, uh, sometimes when you're trying to explain an experience to somebody, something that you've really enjoyed, some trip that you, you took or as a family or some experience that you had, sometimes you know, you're trying to explain it and you just... You're kind of at a loss for words, and you finally just have to say, hey, you just, you had to have been there. You know, if you'd have been there, you'd understand what I'm talking about. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about when we're in this series on encountering God. In this series on encountering God, we're, we're looking at how people, their lives intersected with Jesus. And when their lives intersected with Jesus, something changed for them. Something dramatic happened in their life. And, uh, and, and, and they were left different. You can't have an encounter with God and remain the same. You can't just have, I mean, having a, a mental knowledge, a mental understanding, just studying about God is not enough. You got to experience him. You got to, you got to know him in a personal way. And, and uh, I said this last week, I'll say it again. My pastor used to always say it, pastor, he, he'll say, he would say, once you've had an encounter with God, you can never be a good sinner again. I mean, just. Once you've been touched by God, nothing else will satisfy. I mean, you'll, you can try different things. You can, you can try this. You can try that. But it'll never satisfy because once you've been touched by the Almighty, come on, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, you are forever marked. And so uh, I don't know about you, but I've had many encounters with God, and I'm still looking for some more encounters. I've been praying for you. I'm telling you, I've been praying for you that you would have an encounter with Jesus Christ, that you would meet him face to face. And so what we're going to do today is we're actually going to look at some people, uh, three, that had encounters with God, and we're going to look about their experience and what that means for us today. So I want to read to you, first of all, in Luke chapter 4. Now Luke chapter 4, in verse 18, is it's the story, it's where Jesus is reading and he's reading an Old Testament passage because that's the only Bible that Jesus had, right? And so he's reading this passage in Isaiah chapter 61. Now, what's interesting about this is Jesus is in a synagogue, but he, he's not in the main synagogue in Jerusalem. I mean, that's like the main one. That's the biggest one. That's where all the big name people are. They're there. He's in Nazareth. This is his hometown synagogue. It's a smaller one. Uh, it's a very small town, not a big town. And, and Jesus is there, and this is the synagogue that he grew up in. It's, a, it's the same one that he went to every week as a, as a young boy growing up in his Jewish faith. He would go there every week, and they would pick, have turns, and they would have some of the young men read different passages. And so Jesus is at the synagogue, and they hand him a scroll. Now, it's not like the Bible that we have. You know, I mean, we have the full Bible. This is the, 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 the scriptures... Back then, they were written on scrolls, and so you'd have to roll it out, find a spot to read, and it was kind of pre-planned. And so, remember now, Isaiah was written 700, 700 years before this moment. Are you with me? How many know that there's no coincidence in the kingdom of God? No, no such thing as coincidence in the kingdom of God. You know, sometimes I'll meet people, and they're new to church, they'll say like, Man, it's the strangest thing. You know, last week you talked about something that's exactly what I was going through. It's coincidence, you know. And then 
The next week comes and say, man, you wouldn't believe this. Again, the same, there's no coincidence in the kingdom. God knows your number. Come on. He knows what you're going through. He knows exactly what you need. You're not here by accident today. Today is your day. This is your day of favor. This is your day of freedom. This is your day to experience the kingdom of God, to experience Jesus like you have never experienced before. Today is your day. This is just not a typical Sunday. I hope you realize that. Come on, somebody. Anybody believe that? So they hand him the scroll. Jesus begins to read. This is what he reads. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the pr prisoners and, and the recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Isn't it interesting that Jesus, just by chance, is reading the prophecy that was written about him 700 years ago? Just kind of by accident, right? Come on. You know what's interesting about this passage that he's reading from, Isaiah 61? It's that Jesus doesn't finish the passage. He doesn't even finish the verse. He reads Isaiah verse chapter 61, verse 1, and then part 1 of 2. But he, he doesn't finish the, the rest of the verse uh, of, chap, uh, of verse 2. Because, it's very interesting, I don't have it up on the screen, but can I read it to you? This is the last part. It says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Isn't it fascinating that Jesus left off that last part? I I'm asking a question. Come on, is it fascinating? Is it fa I mean, it's fascinating to me that, that he stopped short and he didn't read that last part because Jesus didn't come to bring vengeance. Jesus didn't come to condemn. Jesus didn't come to bring wrath and judgment. Jesus came to bring life and peace and, and liberty and favor. And so some people have this view of God that that's what he's about, that he's a judge, that he's just out to get you, that he's out to every time you do something just, just to smack you around. That is not what Jesus is about. Jesus on purpose left that off and said, no, I am here to proclaim liberty. I am here to proclaim freedom to those that are oppressed. I'm here to heal the sick, to raise the dead. Isn't that amazing? I love that about Jesus. I love that we are living in this day. Now, remember, this is a synagogue that Jesus grew up in. And so if you read the rest of that story in Luke chapter 4, they're looking at one another, the other guys in the synagogue, and they're going, what's going on? Isn't this Jesus? Isn't this the carpenter's son? What is going on here? And Jesus, when he talks about this being the year of favor, he's, he's talking about this as a, and in their mindset, they thought, they're thinking he's talking about the year of Jubilee, but this is not the time of Jubilee. But, but Jesus is saying, no, I am introducing a period of the Jubilee, the release of, of sinners, the release of debt, the relief, release of people in bondage. Jesus says, I am ushering a new era, the era of the Lord's favor. Do you know that you are living right now in the time and the season of the Lord's favor? You're not living in a time of judgment. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. You're not living in a time of condemnation. Come on. You know John 3, 16 and 17. Jesus says, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. Right? All right. So I'm going to look at today with you. We're going to look at three encounters today and what happens when, when these three people, inter, their lives intersected with Jesus. And so write this down if you're taking notes. The first one, as I want you to write down, is that Jesus heals. We're going to see that Jesus is a healer. Jesus will heal the sick, that he will heal the brokenhearted. If you have cancer today, if you have some kind of sickness, arthritis, uh, whatever disease uh, that you're dealing with, sugar diabetes, whatever, Diabetes, I'm praying and believing today that you're going to be healed in the name of Jesus. Because I believe that I, I believe that God didn't bring you here and have me preach this message just to preach it. I believe that there is a divine appointment, that this is a season. We're talking about encounters. And I believe that today is your day to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. 
If you believe that, can you say amen and give the Lord a hand clap? Come on. You believe that? Amen. And so we're going to look at this story. This is Mark chapter 5, and we're kind of in the middle of the story. We're kind of going to interrupt the story because Jesus is on his way to heal Jairus' daughter. But on this way, something happens. In verse 24, we'll pick it up, the story. It says, Jesus went with them, and all the people followed, crowding around him. And a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. 12 years. 12 years. Verse 26 says, she had suffered a great deal from many doctors. And over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay for them, but she hadn't gotten any better. In fact, she only got worse. Now, we don't know a lot about this woman. The Bible doesn't even give us her name. But we know that in that day and in that culture and in the Jewish culture, she would be considered an outcast because she was unclean. She couldn't eat because of her condition of constant bleeding. She could not even go to church. She couldn't go into the synagogue. Could you imagine that? Matter of fact, we could probably assume that she had never been hugged those last 12 years. We could probably assume that she'd never even been touched because in that day, if you, a clean person, touched an unclean person, you were made unclean, which means now you couldn't go into the synagogue unless you went through all these purification processes and, and offerings and all of that. Are you with me today? In verse 27, it says this, she heard about Jesus. Now that's a whole message right there. Because I could talk to you about the fact that, that it's important for you and me, for us to share our testimony with other people. It's important for us to tell other people about what Jesus has done for us because you never know what your testimony is going to do. The seed of your testimony is going to be planted in their heart and one day they're going to be going through something and they're going to encounter Jesus and they're going to say, I have heard about Jesus. Somebody told me that he's a healer. Somebody told me that he can deliver me. Somebody told me that he could take my sins away. You never know. You might share your testimony, and they look at you, and you're thinking, oh, my God, I'm a weirdo. I'm going to walk away. Okay, forgive me. But you never know what you did in planting that seed. All right. Another, another message. Okay. So she heard about Jesus, and so she came up behind him through the crowd, through the crowd, and she touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I could just touch his robe, I will be healed. Do you see the faith there? Come on. Do you see faith in action? And, and really, we're going to see how Jesus was amazed by her faith. And, because Jesus always responds to faith. She took the initiative. She broke the rules. She went beyond the boundaries. She pressed on through the crowd. She, she said, listen, I am not going to be denied. I have got to touch Jesus. Now, you might remember from last week, if you were here last week, we talked about blind Bartimaeus. How the blind Bartimaeus was there sitting, and he heard again about Jesus. He heard that Jesus, come on, was going to come on by. And so he began to yell out, Jesus, have mercy on me, right? Come on. And the crowd said, shh. And what did he do? He got louder, right? I mean, he got louder. He began to cry out even louder. He said, nothing is going to stop me from a miracle. And this is, I hope you're seeing this, if you're wanting an encounter with Jesus, if you want an encounter with Jesus, if you want to experience him, if you want to have a face-to-face -face encounter with him, there's got to be something in you that you begin to cry out to him and say, I'm not going to be denied. I'm going to push through. I'm going to get to Jesus. Excuse me. I don't mean to be rude, but I've got to touch him. I've got to get to him. And I refuse to be quiet. Amen. Now, if you're here today, if you're here today and you need a miracle in your life, if you need God to do something, you're at the right place. You are primed. You are ready. Because that's 
the prerequisite for miracles that you've got to have a need in your life. If you came today and you actually have a need, you have a deficit in your life, you need God to do something for you, that's the first place to begin with to have a miracle from God. But then you've got to activate your faith and say, I believe that he's here and I'm going to touch him today. Last week we said, don't let Jesus pass on by. Don't let him just walk on by. Just like this lady. There's a crowd around Jesus. She has to push her way in and through just to reach out and touch the hem of his garment. God responds to faith. Look at verse 29. And immediately the bleeding stopped. And she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. And, but look what else happened. Jesus, Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out of him. And he turned to the crowd and asked, who touched me? Who touched my robe? And his disciples looked at him and looked at the crowd and said, are you kidding me? Everybody is touching you. Everybody is wanting to get close to you. Everybody is crowding around. What do you mean who touched you? But Jesus said, no, 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 no. This was different. Somebody touched me in faith. Oh, come on. I believe, I believe that there is somebody in here today that you came today in faith. You didn't just come to church, but you came to church today in faith to say, you know what? I've got to touch him. I've got to touch him. I heard that Jesus is there. And I heard that he can heal me. I heard that he can deliver me. I heard that he can do a miracle in my life. Come on. Is there somebody here today that you came in faith, believe me? Amen. Jesus said, who touched me? Now, it's important to remember that in the, this time, in this period, in the Old Testament, in this that when an unclean person touched a clean person, the clean person was made unclean. But Jesus does a divine reversal to that. Because we're not living in a time of vengeance. We're not living in a time of wrath. We're not living in the time of judgment. Come on, church. We are living in a time of favor. So now, so now, get this. So now, when the unclean person touches the clean person, the unclean person is now made clean. Amen. Now, that could be good all by itself, but I don't want you to miss that. Because what happens is that the enemy of our soul, the enemy tries to bring guilt and condemnation in us so that we won't touch people, so we won't lay hands on the sick, so that we won't pray for people. So he tries to condemn us and make us feel unclean because he knows that we are clean. He knows. Come on, if you're a believer, if you're a believer today, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And if you'll remember, come on. If you'll remember, those two words go together, holy and spirit. Holy means set apart, right, perfect, nothing wrong, no blemish. You have been made holy before, come on, before God, because God doesn't just take away our sins. He gives us his righteousness. And so when you lay hands on the sick, when you touch people, you take their unclean and you replace it with holy. You replace it with clean. You have the power to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. You have power to lay hands on those that are possessed and see them set free by the power of Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't get anything else I say today, grab a hold of that. Grab a hold of that. Just lay hands on people. Bless them in the name of Jesus. Bless them. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Just do it. I'm telling you. Matter of fact, preach out. Slap somebody on the shoulder. Tell them, I bless you in the name of Jesus. All right. Verse 32. 
But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. And then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what happened to her, she came and she fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. The woman was trembling. She was in fear. She knew that something had happened, and she knew that she was thinking, man, did I do something wrong? I, I probably should have asked. I probably should have been more polite. I probably shouldn't have just touched him without asking. But look what Jesus said. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. I love that. I love that. Now, Jesus could have, she could have touched his hem, his garment, been made whole, been healed, and he could have just kept on walking because every, I mean, he was ill, everybody was getting healed, and he was doing all kinds of miracles. But Jesus stopped the crowd. He stopped the parade, and he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to talk to you. I, I want you to know that you've been living in humiliation, you've been living in shame, you've lost your dignity, but today I am restoring that. Today I'm making you whole. Today you're now a daughter. Come on. Don't you love that? I hope you see, I hope you see through these encounters that when people encounter Jesus, they come with shame, they come with such guilt, they come with such humiliation, and then afterwards they leave change, encourage, strengthen, and heal. Let's go to the second one. The second one is that Jesus delivers. See, when you encounter Jesus, he will deliver you. He will set you free. When you encounter Jesus, if you come with a habit, if you come with an addiction, if you come with some kind of hurt that keeps you bound in fear or shame, you can leave change just by a, a touch, just by an encounter with Jesus Christ. Let me read it to you. Mark chapter 5, verse 2 says, When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the cemetery to meet him. The man lived among the burial caves and could no longer be restrained with the chain. Look at this. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as often he was, he snapped the chains from his wrists and he smashed the shackles. And no one was strong enough to subdue him. This man was bound, demon-possessed, demonized. And you know what, Jesus? If you read this story, you'll find out that Jesus doesn't grill him. Jesus doesn't look at him and say, what's your problem? What did you do to get in this condition? See, Jesus never does that. He doesn't, he's not interested in what got you in the condition. He just wants to get you out of that condition and get you set free. Come on, from your habits, from your issues. That's what Jesus does. I love that about Jesus. See, a lot of other people were trying to act like they didn't see the demon-possessed guy. Oh, excuse me, I didn't notice you standing there. But not Jesus. Jesus doesn't ignore the problem. He goes right to it. And he doesn't come to condemn, he comes to set him free. And you know, here's the thing. This guy didn't want to be demon-possessed. He didn't want to have that. He was just bound. And I know today that there's some of you that you don't want to be stuck in your habit. And I know sometimes you, you look at yourself and say, oh, my God, I did it again. I, I asked God to take me and deliver me. And here I am again. I'm doing the same thing again. I, this addiction, this this fear. I want to step out in faith, but I'm bound in fear. Can I just tell you something? Today is your day. You came to the right Sunday. Hello, somebody. This is your day. This is your day of freedom. Jesus not only heals, he delivers, and then number three, he forgives. He forgives. Now, I want you to imagine with me, if you met Jesus, but it was the worst day of your life. It was the most humiliating moment of your life. This is a condition of this woman that we're going to look at right now, the last, last encounter. This woman has just been dragged. Her accusers drag her in front of Jesus, throw him at his feet, and look at Jesus and say, this woman's been caught in the very act of adultery. 
And it's just amazing as we're going to look at this story how that there's two forces. There's a, there's a force of judgment. There's a force of condemnation. There's a force of wrath. And then there's another force at work in this encounter, and it's the force of compassion, and, and it's mercy, and it's forgiveness, and it's a new beginning. And, and, and I don't know, but, you know, you would think God is holy. God is perfect. If there was going to be anybody that would condemn, if there's going to be anybody that could judge, it would, it would be him. But why is it that it's the religious people that are condemning in this story? Why, why, why are they not showing mercy? And so let's read the story. It says, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And every time I read that story, I'm like, uh, are we missing somebody in this story? Uh, usually there's two people that are involved in adultery. I'm just saying, okay, I don't know. I just, you know what? They didn't care about her. That wasn't the point. They were just using her as a pawn to try to trap Jesus. They, they didn't mean any, she didn't mean anything to them. And that's what it says. It says, in the law, Moses commanded us to sow and such women. Now, what do you say? And they were using this question as a trap in order the basis for accusing him. It's a trap because the, the, uh, the law, Moses said, you got to stone her, but they were living under Roman rule and authority, and the Jewish people didn't have the authority to, to, uh, uh, to take care of this issue and, and to pronounce judgment of death upon somebody. And so they're trying to trap Jesus. So this is what Jesus does. He bends down, and he starts to write in the ground with his finger, and then he said to them, if any of you is without sin, let him throw a stone at her. Now, how many of you have ever heard this story? Okay. Don't, don't go to the finish. Just, just stay with here, right here at this point. Let's, let's go back up. Jesus says, if any of you, right, are without sin, let him be the first to throw the stone at her. Pause. Before we read the rest of it, pause. Think about what she's feeling. Probably trying to cover herself, put her clothes back on, thrown at the feet in front of all these men, all these religious leaders, in front of Jesus. And Jesus said, you without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone at her. Whoo! Have you ever been caught? <laughs> I've been caught. If you've ever been caught, you know, your friends get away with it, but you're the one that got caught. Your, your friends were playing around, but you ended up pregnant. You ever been caught? It's an embarrassing moment, isn't it? It's humiliating. And we already, listen, here, let, me, let me just share this with you as a church. Let me just share this with you as a church. You don't have to condemn anybody for sin. They already feel the shame of sin. You, you don't have to throw a stone at somebody. Trust me. They feel the shame of their sin. I know I've felt the shame of my sin. I felt the condemnation of my I, I felt the voice of the enemy look at me and say, James, you are unfit, you are unqualified. Anybody ever felt that? Anybody ever heard that little voice tell you that? It's the voice of the enemy, right? Look at the rest of the story. Again, he stooped down, Jesus, and he wrote on the ground. Man, I wonder what he was writing. I wonder what he was writing. At this, those who began to go away, one at a time, the older to the first, they began to drop their stones and they began to walk away. And Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And Jesus asked the woman, where are those who condemn you? And she said, they're gone. And this is what Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Some of you today came to hear just those words today. 
neither do I condemn you. That's the word of Jesus Christ for somebody today. I don't know who it is, but it's for somebody today. You came here today just to hear those words that Jesus say, neither do I condemn you. That's the kind of God that we serve. Are you thankful that's the kind of God that we serve? Are you, is there anybody in here that you're thankful that we're living in the time of favor? Not the time of vengeance, not the time of wrath, not the time of judgment, but we are living in the day of favor. We're living in a day of grace. We're living in a time of mercy. Come on, somebody. Say thank you, Jesus, with me. Come on, if you're thankful that we're living in this type of day. Ah, oh, man. Sin can be so humiliating. And you take your worst moment, and you can multiply it by a thousand times, and I'm sure that's what this woman was feeling right there, the embarrassment, the humiliation. And our tendency in those moments is to run. Our tendency in those moments is to run. Run from church. Run from God. Run from the, the people that we should be running to. And we run away. Can I just tell you, the safest place to be, when you find yourself in the most humiliating, embarrassing moment, the safest place to be is in the presence of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because he will look at all your accusers. And he'll ride in the sand. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. The Bible says in Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation to those who are in Jesus Christ. And Jesus looked at her, and he said, listen, I do not condemn you first. First, he said that. Then he said, then he said, go and sin no more. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Don't, don't allow that hardship and, and pain don't, don't, don't go down that path that's only going to hurt you. Don't go and sin no more. Would you stand with me today? Here's the, here's the difficult part. Are you, are you listening still? Here's the difficult part. As God gives you the right to choose. You don't have to choose the path of forgiveness today. You don't have to choose the path of grace. You can choose to walk out of here with your shame and your condemnation and your guilt and your bondage. Or today, you can come face to face with Jesus. And you can bring your mess, your stuff, and say, here it is, Jesus. We serve a God that heals, delivers, and forgives. Come on. That's the kind of God that we serve. And this is what I want to do today. If you need a healing, if you need a healing in your body, I want you to just run down here. I, we, I'm out of time, so I need you to just come quickly. If you need a healing in your body, would you come to this side of the altar? Just come quickly, please. If you need a healing in your body, just come quickly. If you need freedom today from any kind of habit, fear, uh, issue that you're dealing with, and you just want freedom, would you come right down here in the middle? Just come quickly. Come on, you, you need freedom today. Right down the middle. There's no shame here. Come on, there's no shame here. If you need forgiveness today, I want you just to come right down here. If you need forgiveness, we're going to pray for you. Now, the key is to stretch out our faith and believe that Jesus is here. Believe that Jesus wants to, to heal us. So I'm going to pray for those that are sick today. If you're in pain today, I'm going to take authority over that pain. I'm going to curse that pain. In the name of Jesus, we're going to speak that. Not only me, I'm going to ask everybody else in this place today to pray. We're going to pray with me. And we're going to pray against pain. We're going to pray for deliverance. We're going to pray that God will set you free from those habits, those hang-ups. We're going to pray for forgiveness today. We're going to believe that we're going to receive this in the name of Jesus. So my prayer team, come help me pray too. Elders, come help me pray. But this is what I want you to do. As we begin to pray, I want you to call out to God. I'm going to pray, but I want you to begin to call out to him, God, heal me. God, save me. God, deliver. God, forgive me. Just begin to call out in this moment. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to fall in this place and we're going to see 
something incredible. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. Come on, church, help me pray. Come on, help me pray, church. Father, we pray against every sickness, every disease. God, every bit of pain, God, people that are in pain, physical pain right now, God, that they would be healed. Those watching online, God, that are healed with sickness, God, that healing would come in the name of Jesus. God, I have a book for you. If you come up here, I'll give you this book. God bless you today in Jesus' name.